thank you all for coming today. Um, we have an amazing speaker lined up. Um, but just as a reminder, next week, Miss is canceled for a job talk, but we will have this the following week. Okay, so uh, hopefully you also enjoyed this very meta question that I put up there today, and I was kind of just testing to see if people read the questions. I'm not sure. It sounds like you do. Um, as is typical, we do some announcements beforehand. So the announcement that um, Miss gets canceled next week is in here. And it also has our speaker for the following week, who is Rudy Abibi, who's at Cornell in um, computer science. So take a look there uh, if you ever forget if Miss is happening. Um, you can see it at the very top. If you have updates, you can add it to this document. Does anyone have updates they would like to share today? Events? Okay. Nothing. All right. Uh, as is typical, we also go through some of the recently accepted papers. Um, so feel free to add the venue and paper name and brief description in this document. Um, italicized ones are ones that we've already described. So here we have multimodal representation of complex spatial data and it's a method where they're presenting and interacting with complex spatial data um, like spreadsheets, crosswords, and Sudoku puzzles on a full page tactile display for uh, visually impaired users. I encourage you to check that paper out. And then also Dream Gigs, designing a tool to empower low resource job seekers. I think this one was a best paper. Um, so definitely check this out. They present the design, implementation, and evaluation of Dream Gigs, which is a tool that identifies the skills that job seekers need to reach their dream job. And also evaluation results show they aid in the process of personal empowerment. So read through this document if you want more details, add papers if you have any that um, you've recently published. And both of these are at Kai, I want to say. Yes, both of these will be presented at Kai. All right, so I will switch. Okay, so um, I would like to present Jessica Holman. So Jessica is currently an assistant professor at Northwestern University. Go Cats! Okay, now I'm here. Um, I did my PhD at Northwestern. They don't have as much school spirit as Michigan. Um, You're very purple. Oh, I'm going to wear my Northwestern purple today. Uh, so before Northwestern, um, Jessica was at University of Washington, and before that she was at Berkeley doing a, was it Berkeley? Post doing a postdoc, yeah. um, as well as before that, doing her MSI and PhD here at University of Michigan, where Aton was her advisor. So we're really excited to have you back here. Um, and her research is all around visualization and communicating uncertainty. Um, with or of complex spatial data. So we'll let you take it away. Cool. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be back here. Um, you know, I'm always happy to be back in Michigan. I'm happy to be back in the Midwest at Northwestern, where I have this job both in computer science and in journalism. Um, so maybe you'll see why as I give my talk. I you know think a lot about things like presenting uncertainty and visualizing data, but I also think a lot about kind of applications where the users are not necessarily experts. Um, so today I'm going to talk about research I've been doing the last few years. Some of it started here at UMSI, so I'll go over a little bit of what I've done before, but really more on kind of what I've been doing since I left. Um, so when we think about visualizations, you know, we often, I think, think of them as this powerful way to amplify cognition, as we say, um, particularly in data analysis. So many of you have probably seen this example from Anscombe, a statistician, which is kind of remarkable in that these four charts if you summarize them using things like the mean and uh, variance of the two variables x and y, or you do a regression, um, they look exactly the same. 
But of course, when you visualize them and inspect them that way, it's evident that they're actually really different. Um, and I think based on examples like this that we've seen and a focus in the visualization research community on kind of visualization's role for data analysis, particularly exploratory data analysis, where like you don't really know what you're looking for, um, we tend to think about visualizations mostly as kind of being for pattern finding, for helping us generate observations or hypotheses that we then follow up um, later with things like statistical testing. So it's a way of kind of finding things that are interesting. But I think this view is actually kind of increasingly unrealistic if we look at a lot of the ways visualizations are used in the world, where we're seeing them more and more in places like the media, as well as scientific communication and analysis. So, you know, for instance, many visualizations, I think, are designed to convey to some user what they can believe about the world based on data, or to, you could say, um, help them separate kind of signal from noise, where the user is not going to follow this up with statistical testing, they're going to look to the visualization as kind of um, the truth about some phenomena. Um, so this visualization here is the best predictions um, from 538's uh, model of the chances, or the vote share for different <coughs> candidates. This was before the election, roughly four months in 2016. Um, and they were running their models on things like poll results, where people reported who they, said, thought, who they thought they would vote for. Um, and so you'd go to the 538 site and you'd see things like this um, telling you kind of... Uh, or giving you some, some signal of kind of what the true vote share is. I think that's how people interpreted this. Um, and we might look to this data as like the best possible signal of the actual you know, percentage support for Clinton versus Trump. Um, but we have to remember, I think, with this visualization and you know, most others that we see, that any single data set or single set of model predictions is just going to be one proxy for whatever it is in the world we care about, whether it's vote share or climate change, um, unemployment, etc. One reason is that the data that we're often visualizing or here using to, to run this predictive model is often a sample. So here, you know, we're, this is based on survey results. Um, you know, you can't survey everybody in the United States, so um, pollsters will use samples of people and there's some error related to that. Um, so measurement error, sampling error. On the other hand, there's also many cases where data might have some bias. So a single data set is not gonna be a perfect representation of the truth, in this case, for instance, if the poll results that are underlying this model um, were also um, uh, sort of biased. So for instance, if we thought that people might under-report their, uh, their support for Trump, that would be problematic. Um, and so, you know, in, in general, when we see a visualization, we kind of want the user to be aware that, you know, any single data set has some potential limitations. So if we look at this visualization, there's one way in which I think it does convey this, which is related to the fact that it shows uncertainty. So we're seeing, um, I think it's actually really hard to see on this projector, but all three of these lines have kind of a confidence band around them to give you a sense that the true vote share for Clinton, you know, could be as low as, say, 45-ish percent or even lower, and the true vote share for uh, <coughs> Trump, if we were to run the election today, could be um, up to something like 45%. Um, and so this is uh, one way that we need to help users acknowledge that the data we're presenting is, in fact, not kind of a perfect record of the truth. But I would say uncertainty presentation is actually not the norm, especially when we look at kind of public-facing venues where we see data, um, but also in some scientific contexts. So um, if you think about how often you see visualizations in your casual encounters with data um, on the web, you know, it's quite striking how rarely we see uncertainty visualized. And even more so, um, you know, how rarely we see it presented in any way that um, implies that the author actually wants you to see it. Uh, so this first one, the Congressional Budget Office, um, I think they are particularly bad in that they often publish statistics on things like the national debt um, without any uncertainty. Um, so they'll be giving you estimates in the trillions um, as though that's, you know, incredibly certain. Uh, when we know that that's not the, the fact. There's lots of decisions that go into how they model um, that are no doubt kind of uh, flawed in various ways, and so we need to get a sense of that. Um, we also see other organizations that are kind of a little bit more straightforward with data, things like Pew Research Center, where here we're seeing estimates of the number of unauthorized immigrants in various cities in the U.S., um, where, you know, they might say later in the article or in the report, like, yes, there's a margin of error here, these are based on samples, um, but the way that they present the data is often kind of leads with the more precise estimate or, or a visualization that conveys precision that's not actually there. Um, so here, you know, they vary it down the page and you might look at this visualization and see differences in the circle sizes and think that means there's actually a difference, 
when you know, we know there's sampling error, and in this case, they're trying to measure unauthorized immigrants, um, there's good reason to think that there might also be various types of bias, because these are not people that want to be measured, presumably. Um, so today I'll talk, in two ways in which, uh, talk about two ways in which I've been using my research to kind of address this problem and improve the way that visualizations, particularly for general audiences, kind of convey um, that there's uncertainty or problems with data. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with this idea of maybe if we give people better visual representations for uncertainty information, they will do better. Um, and uh, in the second half, I'll go on to another um, uh, line of work that deals more with helping people think outside the data that you're showing them and actually think about their prior knowledge. Um, but we'll start here. Um, so how do we currently visualize uncertainty? I'm guessing a lot of you think of these kind of standard statistical graphics when you think of uncertainty. Um, so things like you know, error bars representing confidence intervals or other um, statistical constructs. It could be a standard error. It could be standard deviation. Box plots, um, we could also call sort of summary marks in that they're um, abstracting kind of properties of a distribution, in this case, things like the quartiles. Um, and then on the other hand, we have different types of ways of plotting uncertainty, often probability, to visual variables. Um, so on, uh, on the top there, on the right, we have a scatter plot where we're showing um, something like probability using the lightness value of each point, so darker points are more probable. On the bottom left, we have a violin plot where we're plotting probability to the width at any given x or y position. And then on the um, bottom right, we're using a gradient plot where we're plotting um, the probability as opacity. Um, and so I would argue that you know, a lot of these <laughs> techniques, um, you know, as common as they are, have some major issues. Um, so I won't go over in great detail a lot of the research, um, but there's been plenty of studies that show, for instance, that things like summary marks lead to misinterpretations in part because of the way they look. Um, so when we see error bars, a lot of people think that uh, the part of the bar, or the error bar that's on top of the bar itself, is more probable, because it kind of looks that way. Um, in reality, that's not true. Uh, people also might think that it's a uniform probability range, which is true in some cases, but not always. Um, error bars are used for both multiple different things. Um, on the other hand, with the visual variables, we often see issues where it's simply hard to read the data back from these encodings. Um, so in visualization, we look to things like graphical perception experiments to get a sense of sort of how accurately can people read values back using different encodings. Um, and things like area or width judgments um, are not as good as something like position. Um, things like aspects of color, like lightness in that top right corner, um, very hard to quantify. Even though we can see differences, it's hard for us to put a number on it. And things like opacity or blur, which seem like uncertainty to us, are really, really hard to read. Um, so there's issues with all of these. And I would say a potentially greater problem as well with a lot of these statistical graphic approaches is that it's difficult to compare distributions as well. So often we're looking at, say, multiple distributions, particularly in the sciences, um, but I think with most visualizations we're comparing things, uh, groups, for instance, you know, maybe I've run a scientific study, I have a control and a treatment, um, and I want to ask questions like, well, how reliable is this difference? So maybe my, you know, treatment group did better in terms of, you know, um, exercise, for instance, um, and I might want to ask, well, if I repeated this study, what's the probability I would still see this advantage of the treatment group? Um, these kinds of questions can be very hard to answer when you have these static graphs that show you um, kind of a, the whole distribution at once. And another major problem, um, if we think about uncertainty visualization and when we need it, particularly um, you know, when we have complex data um, in the media as well, um, the problem is that a lot of these statistical graphics are simply hard to apply. So often we have a set of visual encodings that we want to use. So these are all taken from the media. We have, for instance, um, this sort of visualization showing uh, potential candidates in a debate um, ranked. We have um, data showing uh, the difference in scores in different uh, school districts across the country in terms of math and science by gender, or sorry, math and English by gender. And then we have you know, uh, predicted vote choice data. Um, it would be very hard to add something like an error bar to any of these. You could move to like the sort of violin plot uh, standard statistical graphic space to show any of this data, but you're drastically changing the way you're showing it. 
So back as a PhD student at UMSI, actually I was working on uncertainty visualization with Eitan and with Paul as well. And back then I spent some time um, as I was thinking more and more about the visualization of uncertainty, also wondering kind of what helps people comprehend uncertainty. So outside of visualization alone, what do we know about what helps people understand probability? Um, and one of the things I found back then um, was this very robust result from cognitive psych that says that basically if you want people to understand uncertainty information or probability, um, one way to help them is to just express it instead as a frequency. So, you know, um, rather than saying there's an 80% chance that I'm going to catch my bus, if I go to the bus stop at the same time every single day, I might better understand that um, if it was expressed as four out of five times. And this makes sense because this is kind of how we reason about uncertainty naturally in events in our everyday lives. We kind of look at how often an event occurs and doesn't um, and think of it as kind of a frequency. Um, so this has helped with classic Bayesian reasoning problems. Um, but uh, the work that I've been doing is kind of taking this and looking at how can we apply that in a visualization context. And there's kind of two um, bigger picture um, sort of ways I've been doing this. Um, first one, uh, taking static plots like PDFs and discretizing them. I'm not going to talk about this at all because this is uh, work with Matt Kay and you guys have him here and he can tell you all about it and I'm sure you've already heard about it. Um, and then uh, the other sort of further case or more different from the standard statistical graphics would be these animated outcome encoding. So I'll spend a little time talking about these. This is also work I did um, back at UMSI with Eitan and Paul. I'll talk a little about kind of the more recent things we've done here. Um, the idea here is that you're actually going to take samples from the distributions you want to show and um, Actually, I'm not sure if they're animated right now. Uh, but you're going to basically present each sample that you draw from whatever distribution that you want to show, whether it's joint or not, um, as frames in an animation. So this latter idea of animated outcomes is something we call hypothetical outcome plots, where the basic idea is that you have some data set that you want to visualize. So as an example, let's say we have a control group and a treatment group that we've run some, in some study. Um, we want to summarize the results. You know, we could say it's blood pressure, perhaps, in bar charts. So we're going to um, sort of, without uncertainty, we would show two bars in a bar chart showing the average blood pressure in each group. But to show uncertainty with hypothetical outcome plots, the first step we want to do is take that data and basically create alternate versions of it that we could have seen if we re repeated the process that produced the data. So if we ran our study over and over, what are sort of other plausible realizations that we might see? And for this, we can use techniques like bootstrapping and statistics, where you're basically resampling from your observed data with replacement. We can also fit a model to our observed data and then sample from that model. So there's many ways to do this, but what we want to arrive at is basically a bunch of these different data sets um, that are kind of alternative realizations. And then we'll visualize each of these as a frame in an animated visualization, um, uh, keeping the scales consistent, things like the y-axis, so that people can then look at them um, in an animation and sort of um, make comparisons across frames, do things like estimate what's the average variable value for each of these two groups. Um, and so while this seems very different from kind of, you know, the sorts of static visualizations we see every day, there's actually reason um, from the cognitive psych literature to think that this could be effective for um, helping people think about distributions. So um, there's research in perceptual psychology looking at things like if you flash a bunch of stimuli, how well can people estimate things like um, the proportion of the time they saw you know, a certain stimuli, a certain color, or a certain number. Um, and people tend to be pretty accurate at that. Um, and they do so, they make these judgments without conscious effort. So you don't have to be counting how many times you saw something. Um, you can uh, simply kind of make an intuitive estimate. Um, but nobody had applied this really to visualization, um, and that's what we wanted to do. And, um, again, one of the main sort of motivations here is that you can apply this to any particular encoding. So if this kind of frequency, temporal frequency framing um, or encoding works, um, it's quite widely applicable. All we have to do is be able to resample the data, um, uh, which is a pretty flexible process. There's lots of different methods for that, and then show the animations. So the first study we did, um, I think it was a little after I left UMSI, but it was with um, Eitan and Paul Resnick. Um, was to just look at uh, sort of the simplest case where people are making probability estimates, which is something you'd want them to do with an uncertainty visualization. Um, and we looked at hypothetical outcome plots, um, which are just showing basically draws um, from a 95% predictive interval. So 95% of the observed data fell in this interval. 
we showed confidence, or sorry, um, error bars showing those same predictive intervals. So this is kind of like the best case for error bars. They're, they're going to be pretty wide um, compared to something like a 95% confidence interval, which is actually about um, the mean of, of a given group. Um, and then we showed violin plot, same distribution again, 95% of the observations. Um, and we had people do judgments with univariate data. Um, what we were surprised by there was that people could read um, these properties, like what's the probability you know, that the value of a given um, variable is like above some arbitrary number that we would give them. Um, they could do these estimates uh, for univariate distributions almost as accurately or approximately as accurately um, for the most part with the hypothetical outcome plots as they could with the static plots, except for the case when you had um, a lot of variance in your univariate distribution, so your lines are jumping really far, um, and then it was hard to estimate the mean, um, but mostly equivalent, and more importantly, um, what we had thought we would see and what we did see um, is that when you're trying to make multivariate probability estimates, in particular, something called the common language effect size, where you're asking basically, what's the probability um, that B is greater than A here? Um, so what's the probability uh, you know, that um, the higher violin or the higher bar is going to be higher again if we, we repeated this data collection, um, people made much, much more accurate judgments um, with the hypothetical outcome plots. And I think the reason is that it's actually showing them these true multivariate samples. So they can actually estimate this directly by looking at, you know, how much more often is one bar greater than the other. Okay, so this was kind of the first step. Um, since that study, uh, we started looking a bit more at kind of applied tasks where, particularly when you have non-expert users, like in the media, um, that you might want to convey uncertainty to them um, in a way that doesn't really require training um, and um, helps them do better judgments. And so we looked at first at a bunch of different cases where uncertainty has been visualized in the media, um, kind of looking at the types of implied tasks that people were asked to do. And one task that we settled on, which we saw in a few different media visualizations, was this idea of kind of showing people some data and helping them understand um, sampling error, the, whoops, the implications, I guess my animation isn't working, um, the implications of sampling error in that data. Um, so the New York Times did this. They say they're plain, but they're not, but basically um, the New York Times used hypothetical outcome plots actually to show people related to the jobs report, this set of uh, monthly job estimates that you get. Did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, Cl clarification. Uh -huh. clarification question. So were they given the questions after they saw the visualization or before? Always, or generally when we do studies, it's always with the visualization. So okay. we're just asking you, can you do this judgment given the visualization? Okay. In the past study and then in this next one I'll talk about. Um, but the New York Times um, wanted to show people, you know, if you have a, a set of monthly jobs numbers, maybe it looks like this. Um, you know, uh, even when you have an underlying trend uh, that's basically steady growth, there's or no growth, sorry, um, uh, you can get numbers that look, um, you know, uh, slightly different from that. So this should actually be animated. My animation just broke in time for the talk. Um, <laughs> even when you have a steady growth trend, you can get things that look pretty different. So they use the hypothetical outcome plots for that. And this task is really about kind of looking at a sample set of jobs numbers and then deciding what's the most likely underlying trend or what's the most likely kind of model that might have produced this. And so we took this task and turned it into um, kind of our experiment task. We're going to do sort of a, a many trial within subjects experiment where we're going to show people these jobs numbers and then we're going to ask them to make these judgments about um, uh, which of the two models is more likely. Um, so in the first study, we showed people either error bars showing a 95% predictive interval again, or hypothetical outcome plots. Um, they did many of these trials for each one. They chose the most likely model, and then they gave us their confidence. Um, and then we also, um, in another study, looked at static ensembles. So rather than error bars, if you use a bunch of, say, lines showing um, the data, um, so a static way of um, presenting the data that also has this kind of outcome-based framing, how does that compare? Um, to uh, a house that has lines instead. Um, so uh, in doing this, we had a bunch of trials from each person. We could just summarize their accuracy across all these trials, so come up with a single kind of accuracy rate or error rate. Um, but that's just a single number, and so it doesn't really get at kind of, um, you know, how well people did these judgments at different levels of difficulty, for instance. So certain stimuli are going to be more difficult. The one I'm showing here is actually... Um, I think a little bit hard. I think it's slightly more likely that it's the, the one on the left, the no growth, but 
um, we wanted to sort of get a sense of how do people's accuracy vary over kind of the underlying difficulty. And so for that, we used a technique from vision science. Um, my student who worked on this came from a vision science background, and so he wanted to use these psycho, uh, psychometric functions, they're called. So what they are is basically um, a way, or you're, you're having people do a lot of these two alternative force choice tasks, and then you're basically fitting a function that describes kind of as the difficulty of the task or the amount of evidence that, that is in the stimuli changes, how does their accuracy rate change? Um, these are used in psychophysics to calculate what's called a just noticeable difference, which is basically um, describing kind of the boundary between what a user can see and cannot see um, as a function of the amount of evidence or the amount of information in that stimuli. Um, so that's kind of uh, the method we're using here. Um, and to fit these functions for each person, so we can then look at them and the just noticeable difference, we need people to do a lot of these tasks. So we need to get a lot of data particularly around kind of the inflection point of the function, where this task is most difficult for them. Um, so we're having them uh, make a bunch of these judgments, and um, you know the sort of naive way to do this would be come up with a bunch of trials and have everybody do all of those trials. Um, but the problem is that people are good at this task to different degrees. So if you gave everybody the same trial, you might get sort of bad fits for some people because that person, um, you didn't test enough where it's actually hard for them. So what we did is use what's called a staircase procedure. It's used a lot in psychophysics where you're basically going to um, figure out what stimuli to show people on each trial based on their prior sort of accuracy. Um, so we use what's called a, a three-step by one-step staircase. So every three correct answers you get, I'll start playing that again, basically every three correct answers you're going to move um, to a slightly more difficult stimuli, whereas every incorrect answer that you get, um, you're going to jump back up um, to an easier stimuli. And so this just gets us a lot of data where it's actually hard for people. Um, to do this, we needed to have like an, a measure underlying the stimuli of how difficult each stimuli was. So how difficult is it to tell which of these two underlying models produced the stimuli? Um, for that, we use the absolute value of the log of the ratio between the probability that one model, the no growth model, produced the stimuli versus the growth model. So here we're seeing a bunch of stimuli base, and we're seeing kind of their difficulty level in terms of absolute log ratio, um, where for no growth, it means that it's more likely to have come from the no growth model, uh, whereas the top row shows you the ones that are more likely to come from the growth model by some amount. Um, so this is the results just from that first experiment we did where we were comparing with error bars. Um, again, this was within subjects, so people are going to make a lot of these judgments with hypothetical outcome plots, a lot of these judgments with error bars, we're going to counterbalance which ones they start with. What we're seeing here are the just noticeable differences, um, so this is in terms of this uh, measurement or this measure that I just described, the absolute value of the log of the ratio of probabilities. Um, basically, lower means better, so lower means you're able to make an accurate judgment um, at, with less information in the underlying stimuli. These are 95% confidence intervals, but then we're also animating using hops. Um, uh, and this gives you a sense of, for any given person, kind of how they did with hops and how they did with error bars. Um, so uh, these are estimates of effects also, so the, um, the order in which they did it is averaged out. Um, but you can see that pretty much everybody did better with hops. So there's strong correlations in this data because it's a within subject study. Um, but hops is basically always lower um, than error bars. Uh, and to give you a sense of the effect size here, we have just an example of stimuli um, that someone who used hops would be able to get correct, and someone who used error bars would not. So the one on the left, a uh, hops user would be able to say that's from the growth model, or more likely to be from the growth model. Um, the one on the right, the no growth model. But an error bar user would not be um, accurate, or they would not do better than change. Um, and so then one other interesting thing, so we ran another study like this with the line ensembles and line-based hops, saw similarly that there was a lower JMD with the actual animated hops, so it's not just that there's a discrete framing. Um, but the other interesting thing that I wanted to, to talk about now um, is that the order in which you use the two visualizations, so whether you started with hops or started with error bars, also mattered here. Um, so there was a learning effect. Um, but in particular, if you used hops first, you then did better with error bars later. Um, so, I mean, there's, I think, still more research to kind of tease out what's happening here. 
but it's suggestive of the fact that something about using hops helps you build maybe a better mental representation. Um, so maybe you're relying less on the stimuli in the second set or the second block of trials. So you're, you somehow have an advantage from using hops first, um, which I think is kind of interesting. A lot of the, um, you know, the motivation when we first started talking about hops, me and Eitan and Paul, I think was that um, they might help people better grasp without any training kind of what it means for something to be uncertain. And it's, this result seems potentially indicative of something where it's, there's something about the intuitions that you're developing that might be helpful. So, um, you know, this first line of work, I think, suggests that, you know, there's, help, there's hope for helping people better understand uncertainty. Um, you know, better visualization techniques can help. Um, like I said, Matt can tell you about the quantile dot plots, but for hops, you know, we found better probability estimates, greater sensitivity to judgments with noisy data. Some more recent work, we've actually looked at Bayesian reasoning. I probably won't have time to go into today, but we've also seen that they help people update their beliefs in a more rational way as well, um, compared to not showing uncertainty. Uh, so, um, you know, I think visualizations can help, but I also feel pretty sure that visualization is not the only thing that's going to help when it comes to actually getting more people, particularly in the media and public facing venues, to present uncertainty. So a thing that I've been thinking a lot about, um, just because it seems inevitable given the work I do, is kind of why we don't see uncertainty communication more often. Um, and, you know, I think there's actually a lot of reasons that um, authors might have that on some level are rational or make sense. So I think you know, there's this sense that people, when they're looking at data, are often already overly overwhelmed kind of with information. And so adding uncertainty is kind of further burdensome um, on a cognitive level. I think there's lots of feelings that people won't understand it. Um, a lot of times, especially if you're a scientist, you don't know what other people can understand and you might doubt that they can interpret it appropriately. Um, lots of other reasons as well, I think, including that it's hard to calculate and there, there's not good visual techniques. Um, so I've been kind of talking to visualization authors to try to get a better sense of, in particularly when you're visualizing data for kind of a general audience, why might you not show uncertainty? So, so visualization alone is maybe not the answer. Um, so I want to talk now for the rest of the time I have about this other line of work I've been doing, which is not really about visualizing uncertainty, so much is kind of trying to prompt people to think outside of just the data set they're given. And the way we've been doing that is by thinking about kind of how can we get people to reflect on the prior knowledge that they have before they see some data set. Um, uh, just help them realize that any single data set is not kind of the complete truth. So to give you a sense of what I mean by this, um, I actually started, again, thinking about this back as a PhD student at Michigan, where I kind of got interested in this idea that when we look at a visualization, we're actually making an implicit comparison to something, um, some expectation that we have. So for instance, if you look at a histogram, I think you're kind of implicitly often comparing to a normal distribution. Um, you look at a line chart or a scatter plot, you might implicitly be comparing to sort of a diagonal line. Um, uh, so part of this is about kind of the chart you're using and what's the sort of standard reference there. Part of it, though, is also about the content of the data. So given what I know about whatever variable I'm looking for or looking at, I might expect things to be maybe somewhat skewed in some cases. So there's, there's some reference that I have that depends on, um, you know, my, my prior knowledge of graphs and my prior knowledge of the data. And so a few years ago with my student, PhD student, Yasuo Kim, I started thinking a lot about, well, how could we do this in a way um, that got people to reflect on prior knowledge as they used a visualization. And we thought that interactive visualizations have this nice ability where someone could actually draw a prediction um, and uh, that would be a way of getting them to reflect on what they think and perhaps you know, we could show the data after they draw that and they would actually see sort of the gap. Um, so if, as a quick example, you know, imagine I'm gonna show you some data on how people in Ann Arbor are gonna vote in 2020 presidential election by income bracket. Um, you can maybe think about what you would guess for these three different income brackets. Um, in particular, how many people will vote Democratic, I should say. I imagine if you did this and then I showed you the real data, it would be hard for you not to wanna to compare, even if you, know, you don't see your prediction. So if you imagine that you did see your prediction and the data, there's kind of a natural sort of um, comparison I think that happens. Um, and so in a, several initial studies that we did, we wanted to look at just what's the effect on kind of uh, what people pay attention to when you show them data of doing this simple task. So we're going to let people draw a prediction in a line chart and then show them the real data um, against their prediction. Um, and so when we started thinking about this, we realized that there is some literature in educational psych that relates a little bit 
um, to this idea of having people reflect on their own knowledge as they're looking at information. Um, so there's something called self-explanation, which is this very robust effect, basically, where when you're, when you're learning something new, if you take the time to stop and try to explain the information to yourself, you um, often do better on comprehension tasks, you better remember it later. And the idea is that by kind of explaining to yourself, you're realizing gaps in your knowledge and you're filling those gaps. And so um, in this first study, we thought, well, maybe we could test this against self-explanation and then see kind of does it have a similar effect. Um, we looked at recall, um, so the ability to remember the data that we showed you after a distractive distractor task. Um, and we found that there was um, an effect on recall um, that was very similar to the self-explanation effect. Um, so simply by drawing your prediction and seeing it against the data, you remember the data better by about 20 to 25%. Um, we varied things like um, what the data set was. So we thought, well, maybe there's cases where people don't have any prior knowledge and this won't actually work. Um, and so we did a uh, highly familiar data set, moderately familiar, highly unfamiliar, where we judge or we defined familiarity based on how well people could actually predict that data. And we found that this works not for really familiar data. There's just not a, enough room, perhaps, to improve. Um, but it works for moderately familiar data and for really unfamiliar data. Um, so if, even if people have no idea what it is, we showed them kind of obscure scientific experiment results. Um, something about this act of making a prediction, even if your prior doesn't mean much, kind of helped you maybe pay attention to what the data was. Um, we also then wanted to look at how people update their beliefs. Um, so we did a second study where we also brought in this notion of updating your beliefs. So we also got their final beliefs after they saw data, but we also looked at things like if you show them others' beliefs, how does that impact things? And kind of the takeaways here for one um, was that, you know, not surprisingly, um, depending on what you believe before you see the data, um, uh, you um, may or may not kind of update towards the data. So if you disagree with the trend in the data going in, you're going to be less likely to update your beliefs to resemble um, the data. Social information can sort of um, come into play in this. So if I disagree with the data, but other people agree with kind of the trend in the data, then I might be more likely to update my beliefs towards the data. But basically, kind of my own beliefs matter. What other people believe matters in certain cases. Um, uh, and we also did look at recall as well and found that um, simply seeing other people's beliefs without seeing your own as well um, at all can also help you remember things better. So there's a lot of kind of little, I think, effects where um, doing this task is helping people pay attention um, and it's actually changing to some extent how they, or not changing, but it, it has an impact. What they say they believe coming in has an impact on what they believe later. Okay, so uh, the first few projects were kind of looking at almost rhetorical effects of doing this and, you know, it seems like there's some positive effects here. Um, but one thing we realized is that it would be nice if we could also sort of have a normative account of what people's beliefs should look like. So um, after they see the data, what, what should they then think, um, given what they thought before and given the information in the data. And we realized that one way that we could get at kind of this sort of normative account would be if we also got a sense, not just of you know, a, a single prediction or what they thought was most likely, but also the uncertainty in that prediction. Um, so. Uh, here, if we can do this, um, get uncertainty in their prior and then ask them their beliefs after we see the data, also with uncertainty, then we can use Bayesian inference to basically um, predict what they should believe using um, kind of the normative posterior. So um, in Bayesian in inference, you're trying to estimate some prior, uh, or sorry, some parameter, um, just for simplicity, let's say, you know, the true vote share for Clinton on some particular date. Um, and uh, so what you should believe after seeing data that I might show you on an estimate of, of that value is uh, equivalent to whatever you believed before about different um, values of that parameter um, times what's called the likelihood, which is a distribution um, that's uh, basically conditional for the data. Um, uh, so it's kind of telling you, you know, that your posterior is basically um, should be equivalent to your prior sort of um, uh, weighted by the data that you saw. So to understand kind of what people are doing, we, we took this framework where we're going to elicit their priors with uncertainty, we're going to elicit their posterior with uncertainty, and then we're just going to compare to what Bayesian inference says that they should believe. So we have their own posterior, and then we'll calculate the normative Bayesian posterior. So if they updated their beliefs rationally according to Bayes' rule, this is what they should believe. Um, 
just as a, as a disclaimer before I go into the results, um, I think one thing where I've seen people get a little confused is that um, you know, I'm not saying that people have to be perfect Bayesians. So in order to kind of learn about what people are doing, this model that people you know, update perfectly rationally according to Bayes' rule doesn't have to be correct. Um, so what we're, we're doing is kind of using this framework to learn about what people are doing, um, not to say that they should be right exact with kind of normative Bayesian inference. Uh, so the, for the first study we did, um, we wanted to take kind of a simple data set um, so we took uh, just proportion data, basically a single proportion. Sometimes you see these, uh, this kind of data presented in the media with things like icon arrays. Um, so um, we took, uh, to start with, just a proportion that um, came from an actual media example where it was about the percentage of women um, in a survey of people in the tech workforce who had said that I think mental health affected their work often or more. Um, so we're going to present this survey result we're going to present it in an icon array, um, and we're going to basically look at people's prior and posterior beliefs, um, compare those to what we expect from Bayesian inference um, as a way of kind of understanding to what extent do people look Bayesian. Um, so to get their prior and posterior, we need a way to basically elicit this prediction with uncertainty of what they think this, this actual percentage of women affected by mental health issues in, in the tech workplaces. And so we use a technique from the literature that's basically been validated as a way to sort of get um, someone's uh, best kind of guess of a proportion with uncertainty. So we're going to basically ask them first, you know, what do you think this proportion of women is? And then we're going to show them an interval that contains whatever they said and ask them what's the probability that the true proportion falls in that interval. Um, and this was, um, you know, shown in, in work in judgment and decision making to be less noisy than other ways of getting um, uncertainty around a predicted proportion. So there's the data, we showed them in an icon array. Um, and kind of as a first step, after we got people's posteriors and had their priors and could compare them, we wanted to just understand um, kind of categorically what are people doing. So are people overweighting the data, like the proportion that the data gives them? Are they overweighting their prior, um, their prediction? Are they doing something closer to sort of perfect? Um, and so in the initial study, which was more like a pilot, I think we had about 100 people, um, we saw almost or roughly equal proportions of people either overweighting the proportion of the data or overweighting their own prior. So I think it was like 40 something here and 30 something here. We saw a very small number of people who um, uh, did very well relative to the normative posterior, so updated in a way that um, you know, implied they were you know, perfect Bayesians, uh, assuming this simple model was in fact a good uh, record of what people do, which I don't think it is. Um, but then um, past this categorical sort of analysis, we also wanted to look at kind of um, how close are their posterior distributions quantitatively. So we used um, KL divergence, which is basically a way of measuring the distance between two distributions or the similarity between them. Um, and we found at the individual level, um, you know, you could say that people are pretty far off from the normative Bayesian. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of deviation in both directions, both overweighting prior, overweighting um, the observed data, but uh, very few people were very close. However, we also thought, well, you know, often there's this um, sort of talk about wisdom of the crowd and how people maybe are sometimes better in aggregate. And so we also took um, the prior beliefs people gave us and calculated kind of the aggregate prior. So what's the sort of average um, prior for a person? And we took the aggregate or the posterior beliefs they gave us, calculated the aggregate posterior. And then we compare that to the normative Bayesian sort of aggregate posterior. So what you would expect them to believe given the crowd's aggregate prior. Um, and here we saw um, that people looked much, much closer to the normative Bayesian um, posterior. So much less deviation than we saw at the individual level, um, which I'll speculate more kind of about what that means in a moment, but is not totally unsurprising given um, similar work in cognitive psych on Bayesian cognition. Uh, but um, you know, after this first study where we saw the, these two kind of effects at the individual and aggregate level, we then wanted to look at kind of how robust this is. So we had only tested one data set, so then we changed the data set. So we found another data set from the media about um, uh, the per percentage of people in assisted living centers who have um, dementia. And we also wanted to vary the sample size. So we know that people aren't always super sensitive to sample size. So we thought, well, we should see whether this is still the case with a, a larger data set. Because our initial data set, I think the sample size was about 158, maybe, I think. 
Um, so this second data set was a very large sample, actually reported in the media, of 750,000 residents of assisted living centers. Um, we made visualizations of each, um, and uh, so we had basically four cells in this study, each data set framing times the two sample sizes. And just to give you an intuition for sort of in, within Bayesian inference, kind of how sample size matters, if you have a very small sample, only a sample of 30, with a given prior, um, your norm at posterior should still be pretty close to your prior, just because there's so much uncertainty about the true proportion um, based on the small sample size. But when you have a large sample size, um, 3,000, say, with the same prior, your normative posterior or the normative um, prediction would be that you're much closer because there's a lot more information based on the larger sample size. What we found, though, was that people were not very sensitive to the large sample size. So um, while they were still better in aggregate than they were individually across the board, um, they were no longer very close to normative in aggregate with a very large sample. Um, so this suggests, you know, that, um, you know, people, they don't, um, they just don't grasp the importance of sample size as it gets very big for actually giving you information. Or there's something else going on. So, um, you know, we could conclude that people are just bad with sample size, um, but I think there's actually sort of other reasons that are more nuanced that might provide um, kind of explanation for this. Um, so it's possible that people, um, you know, uh, were different from the assumptions of our very simple Bayesian models. It's possible people, that people think that some data sets have bias or some sources of data are more credible than others. So we weren't modeling that. So it's possible that people discounted, you know, the source of this data. Um, and that's why they weren't just like the normative. Um, we also didn't convey sample size um, in the, the large sample visualization. So each icon, based on the original we took from the media, represented 600 people here, so it's possible that if you actually showed 750,000 icons, they'd be a little bit closer. Um, these top two are things that we're now working on. Um, but another possibility that I think is, is reasonable to bring up is that their priors might not have been actually their priors. So maybe we didn't get a good representation. Um, and so one thing that we did look at, which is kind of the last piece of this study that I'll show you, um, is that we actually wanted to ask this question about, you know, how sensitive are the results we're seeing to how you elicit their prior and how you elicit their posterior. Um, and so in thinking about kind of what are um, plausible ways to elicit their prior beliefs and their posterior beliefs, we came back to this finding that like in aggregate people appear to be pretty close to the normative Bayesian um, and thought about kind of what that suggests. Um, so there's research in Bayesian cognition in cognitive psych, which is really kind of a new emerging area. Um, that's kind of interesting in that it shows that in aggregate, people can predict these kind of everyday quantities, things like cake baking times or lifespans, um, extremely accurately. Um, and uh, so they'll ask questions like, you know, say a cake's been in the oven 10 minutes, um, how long do you think before it's done? And what they find is that, you know, at an individual level, people are very noisy, but in aggregate, they're almost perfectly predicting the true cake baking time and the it appears that what people might be doing is thinking of sort of a single sample or a couple samples. So when you ask them this question about cake baking times, they might think, oh, I know a cake that takes 35 minutes. And so they answer based on a small number of samples. Um, and that is something you might get if they are, um, or that is one thing that's consistent with this um, Bayesian and aggregate. Um, and so we basically wanted to vary the extent to which the elicitation technique made them think in terms of samples versus think in terms of a full distribution. Because it's possible people don't actually have a full mental distribution of things like cake baking times. Um, so we designed uh, basically some different interfaces. One is entirely sample based, so it's almost like we're having them draw hops, like give us five um, uh, uh, predictions on icon arrays where you click to tell us the proportion. We did a text-based version of that. Um, we also had them uh, use this initial technique that I showed you where they give us the most likely proportion with uncertainty. You could call this kind of one sample plus partial distribution because you're asking for like the most likely sample. And then we had them actually draw a full distribution in another condition using this kind of distribution builder. Um, so the results here were nuanced. I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, but the things that were interesting were, one, the pattern of results stayed consistent. So the elicitation technique didn't have a very big um, impact. Um, however, um, for uh, the data sets we did, um, there was some evidence that the full distribution was um, producing less meaningful subjective distribution. So 
Um, you know, overall, they weren't uh, much, much more terrible, but if we, when we looked through the results, we saw things like people who used the full distribution had a tendency to give us distributions that um, appear to be kind of centered within the interface. Like people um, were kind of being influenced by the interface itself, um, maybe less so than actually what was in their head if they had something in their head. Um, and so um, the results, you know, are not definitive in any way, but they were suggestive that the sample stuff worked um, perhaps a bit better or gave us more meaningful things. Um, I think this is powerful just kind of as a way to wrap up my talk um, because, you know, uh, if people think in, in terms of samples and we want interfaces that are going to sort of um, prompt people to think outside the data, think about prior knowledge, we can elicit them by just having them draw samples. So it's almost like hops as an interaction paradigm for um, uncertainty on multiple levels. Um, so then we fit a prior to the samples, which is what we were doing in this research, and then to show them the observed data, similarly we use samples. And so it's almost a framework um, that we can imagine for sort of rethinking interactions with data in a way that um, emphasizes uncertainty. Um, so we're doing a lot of um, new research based on this. So now we're work looking at things like given someone's prior, um, can you personalize how you show the data in a way that then makes them um, un uh, comprehend uncertainty better? Um, we're doing things like these simple analogies where given the uncertainty in your prior, we tell you kind of how that compares to the uncertainty in, in the data, um, almost as a way of visualizing uncertainty without ever really visualizing it, um, looking at whether that helps. I'm also really interested in kind of update types. So do people consistently update their beliefs like in the same way? Um, within a person, like we know that people appear to be different overall, um, but is there kind of um, individual consistency? We recently built and released an authoring tool so that uh, journalists could create interactive line charts that basically allow their users to make just a single prediction for now, um, but then they can see other readers' predictions. Um, so part of my like big agenda is to start um, trying to get people to do this in the world, particularly journalists, so that I get then the data on people's beliefs. Because I'm really interested in kind of where are, you know, people like news readers' intuitions about things like climate change, you know, um, macroeconomic stuff correct and where are they not. I think that could change how we design visualizations. Um, I think our next step is to add uncertainty elicitation to that in some sort of lightweight way. It might just be people tell us lower high confidence, um, but it gives us more information. And then finally, I'm interested in extending this more to expert users. So I've done a lot with sort of the general audience, which I think on some level can be the harder case. Um, but, you know, um, with experts, you might have more flexibility in what you can ask them to do and more power. So um, I'll just end it there. Thanks for your attention. I think it went a little long, um, but I'm happy to take questions if you can stay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Really cool. Yeah. On the work on the uh, where the people are making predictions and they can see the other's predictions, mm -hmm. you're saying that they're more likely to remember it if their prediction was, was aligned with the, with the social? Um, no. So the recall thing, yeah, so the recall thing was actually slightly separate there. So seeing other people's predictions alone helps you, re helps you um, it appears, like pay more attention to the data. You can somehow remember the data better only seeing other people's predictions. So it's my own prediction wouldn't be shown at all, and okay. I wouldn't even give you a prediction. It would just be seen the same. Oh, I see. So that was a different thing. There were two things that this second study did. One was to move to looking at updated beliefs, so also getting a prediction after they saw the data, but not with uncertainty. So we couldn't do any of the sort of Bayesian stuff, but starting to look at updated beliefs, um, but also showing other people's beliefs. And that's because like the New York Times has done some of this, where they actually show you other people's beliefs after you make your predictions. So. What I was wondering about is, that, is the recall influenced by how accurate the others were about the actual data? Um, it was, yeah, so I didn't explain this, but it was not at, about accuracy. So we, um, we didn't have like a, a true model. We had a data set, like observed data set, but we didn't have a, a true, like we didn't know the true value of the parameter and we didn't try to model that. So we couldn't really say um, if others were accurate, um, but we found that others' beliefs, as long as they weren't all over the place, would help you. So if other people's beliefs like disagreed a lot with each other, um, other people were kind of all over the board in terms of the slopes of their lines and um, the variance between them, then it, it, it was like potentially maybe too distracting, but you, you didn't remember better. So. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> kind of explained it probably a little clearer. I was kind of rushing through this. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you ever consider like, actually and how that relates to you know, the understanding 
Yeah, so often we'll get, um, just like we'll use like a numeracy scale, there's one called Berlin numeracy scale. Usually what I've found um, when we put it in models, which we usually do, if we get it, is um, there's a, like a very reliable effect, but it's pretty small. So it helps um, predict you know, how you're going to do on these comprehension tasks, et cetera, um, but it's um, generally not a huge effect. And I think um, you know, potentially people um, maybe get overwhelmed doing all these questions. Like I'm not sure what it is. Um, the one that I've used has been the Berlin one, where it's basically a series of like questions about kind of um, you know probabilities. And so um, uh, yeah, it's it, it explains something, but usually not a ton. But I do think that's an important thing to get out of kind of like the difference between or the effect of expertise is something that um, I want to look at more by moving to kind of an expert domain. I saw another back there. Maybe? You're talking about people. Who are your subjects? Yeah, so I um, have been doing a lot of the things. I think pretty much everything I presented on today was on Mechanical Turks. So these were general audiences. Um, uh, part of the reason for releasing the tool, of course, is that we want to start looking at this more in the wild. So things like news readers. Um, but so far, yeah, these were, I think everything I presented today was Mechanical Turk. Um, yeah. Um, super fascinating work. I was curious, um, because you've been looking mostly at like, the uncertainty that we calculate using some statistical method, mm -hmm. and kind of explaining, seeing how the audience can understand that and interact with these results and graphs. Um, I was curious if you've done any work on where we have situations where there's just uncertain data to begin with, and it's uncertain and probability of what. Like, let's say I have statistics of uh, deaths during process of arrest in the United States where the numbers are just not known and and how we can communicate that uncertainty yeah. with visualization. I think that's a very relevant question. I think a lot of times the uncertainty is hard to quantify at all. Um, that's something Matt and I actually have been working with a postdoc at Northwestern, um, Lace Padilla, on, um, where we're starting to look at kind of if you give people this extra layer of uncertainty where you can't quantify it, but you say, you know, maybe we're, you know, semi or highly sh certain that this model's not perfect or whatever, um, what do they do with that? So I don't have results yet, but I think that's a, a very relevant problem. I think it comes up a lot, um, perhaps more than the quantifiable uncertainty. Yeah. This is cool. Uh, do you think that people could have a domain that they could use to like if you would try to tell them that they can learn how to do this, they'll get better at doing it? Potentially, yeah. I haven't... Um, I haven't, I don't know the like, literature on the growth mindset, I've heard about it for sure. Um, I mean, I think a lot of my research is kind of like implicitly trying to figure out ways to make this something that people could do more often, where it would um, make it less scary to them, but I haven't, I guess some of our re most recent work where we're using priors to sort of come up with these kind of personalized analogies would maybe be closest, where we're kind of trying to give you some personal information about what to do, but not quite, like I haven't quite gotten to the point where I'm sort of prompting people to try to, to do better. Uh, do you have something in mind on that? Or? Yeah, I was just curious. I'm yeah. just thinking, like, people probably feel like they're really bad at stats or whatever. It is. Right. So if you say, no, you're very capable of being Yeah, so like maybe giving them feedback on when they've done well on something. Yeah, it's kind of built on the norms. Right. Bit, yeah, no, I think that would potentially be valuable. Yeah, I do think a lot of people have perceptions that just graphs are hard and stats are hard. And, Follow on to that one. Um, when you get people to, to change their, 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 their posterior, to change their, their beliefs, is it about the distribution or do they relate it to the underlying data again? I've seen some evidence in social studies that students can say, oh, the slope is this, and when you ask them what does that mean, that's right. when they... I think there's a big question about um, when you ask them for their posterior beliefs, like to what extent do they, on like a mechanical Turk study, to what extent do they understand that I'm not asking you to just give me back the data? Is that related to what you're asking, or? Um, perhaps. So if I'm showing you something about uh, household income and percent voters who will vote Democratic, mm -hmm. do people get a relationship? Can they tell you afterward, oh. oh, I thought poor people would vote this way and rich people would vote that way, but the data is saying something different? So can they say that beforehand or after they see Either. the data? Either. Um, we have them give, like, um, in, in one of the studies um, where we first started eliciting predictions, we had them also kind of explain what they were thinking, and it, um, I mean, it seemed like the predictions they gave were consistent with the way they were interpreting things. Um, 
uh, yeah, we haven't done anything really more sophisticated other than just kind of using what they tell us to cor corroborate kind of what they give us. But yeah, um, I think there's lots of questions about what they give us and how, what does it really mean? Like, to what extent um, should we take that as like a precise estimate versus they had to create something? And um, these are things where um, we actually, in one of our studies, the Bayesian cognition one um, that's published at CHI this year, we also looked at like how much does 